Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless you never know when someone's gonna just decide to ruin your day lock the window a flying mcdouble is one thing flying bullets another on tuesday night a homeless man tried to rob a woman on a New York City subway platform. He reportedly told the woman, give me a dollar or I'm taking your purse. A bystander had seen enough. John wrote, reached into his backpack, pulled out his sidearm, and fired a few warning shots into the tracks. Homeless guy ran off and so the subway vigilante, or whatever you call him. And both were eventually arrested. Homeless guy was hit with attempted robbery and was released on no bail. And the so-called vigilante who was gainfully employed and legally owned the gun in West Virginia, he was charged with reckless endangerment, menacing, and another charge, and had to post $10,000 bail. Now, Primetime doesn't think we should allow people to be blasting off warning shots underground in subways, but is this fair? When police are defunded and demoralized and politicians allow dangerous homeless men to run wild, your average man is faced with a choice. Do you protect a woman in distress, as your instincts tell you to do? Or do you watch like a coward as a man robs and violates a helpless woman? Criminalizing the masculine instinct to protect innocent women being preyed upon will have disastrous consequences and condition American men into being pathetic bystanders without honor or moral decency. Noble Americans are taking matters into their own hands everywhere. In Florida, a veteran stops a carjacking because his training kicked in. It's a white male bailing. He's now a Starbucks. Police say their dash cam shows Prouty trying to carjack a woman, but Shane Spicer jumps in the passenger seat trying to stop him. Hey, get on the ground, get on the ground! Body cam video shows Spicer again holding onto the suspect while officers run up to arrest him. I feel like if, if you got like the ability to watch out for someone, <clears throat> that you should. We thank Shane for his service and for saving the woman's life. Being an upstanding person and did the right thing. There is no better example of real manhood than Jesus Christ. Christ's example, as given in the Bible, shows us how to express male traits in a positive way. Jesus was unafraid to show his emotions over the death of Lazarus, as we read in John 11, 35 and 36. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Jesus was also willing to chase crooks out of the temple with a whip, as we read in John 2, 13 through 16. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Christ had compassion for others, as we read in Matthew 15, 32, and verses 35 through 37. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat and I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Jesus demonstrated forgiveness. Luke 7, 44-48 then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, 
but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Jesus demonstrated humility. John 13, 12 through 17. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus demonstrated bravery, love, and extreme generosity. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Not only did Jesus give his life to save all of mankind, he endured the most horrendous beating beforehand. Jesus gave everything he had to bring humanity back into right relationship with God, which is the most generous gift of all. We've all made mistakes, especially me. If you want forgiveness, you need to be honest and take responsibility for what you've done. Growing up, we learned this from our parents in church and school, but it doesn't seem like these values are being taught anymore. Today, some people are told they're the victim and nothing is their fault. This mindset created an army of entitled young adults who are now clashing with traditional America. This week, we saw a video that perfectly captured what's happening in our country. This video is from a police body cam during a traffic stop. It happened back in April in New Mexico. A driver was pulled over for driving on the wrong side of the road. What's going on? Nothing. Why are you driving in the wrong way of traffic? No, I just got changed around. I just moved here like two months ago. Then the state trooper asked her to get out of the car. Can I just have you step out? We'll go look it up on my computer and I'll get you out of here. Sorry, I just have like really bad social anxiety and stuff. It's like, I don't want to step out whenever you're asking for stuff. Okay, well we're past that. Sorry, just like as an indigenous person. So she's anxious and indigenous. What happened next? Miss Perry? Am I well, I'm non-binary, so... Okay. Okay, so she's anxious, indigenous, and non-binary. Is that why she's driving down the wrong side of the road? Hey, I'm smelling alcohol. I know. How much have you consumed tonight? Like, probably three drinks. All right, so she's driving down the wrong side of the road because she's drunk, not because she's an anxious, indigenous, non-binary. Time for a field sobriety test. Follow the finger. Stand facing me, please. But I just want you to know that I also have very bad social anxiety. You and me both. Okay. More anxiety, okay? Let's get on with the test. I want you to focus on the tip of my finger, okay? Focus on my finger, please. I am. You're just, like, trying to intimidate me. I don't know how I'm trying to do that. This is just how the test goes. I know, but you're exaggerating it more than it needs to be right now. This is just the test, okay? No. Wait. As you know, as an indigenous person and there's a bunch of shit going around, I'm sorry, but it's just for me to be on my toes. Okay, I can't follow your finger because I'm indigenous? Stop bullying me with your field sobriety test? Do you remember that I told you that I'm non-binary? Yeah, I'll try my hardest. Okay? It's not something that I deal with every day, so I'll, I'll have the, uh, the mistake of the habit, right? Please. So I'll refer to you as Kai, right? Yes. The officer can't remember that she's non-binary, but she can't remember what side of the road to drive on. What's more dangerous? Now for the second part of the test, walking in a straight line, excuse me, a non-binary line. I want you to go ahead and put your left foot on that four inch wide line, just like I'm doing. Now with your right foot, Place it in front of your left in a heel-to-toe touching manner with your arms by your side, just like this, ma'am. Can you 
not call me ma'am, please. I'm trying my hardest. Okay, well. Okay. It means a lot to me. I'm trying my hardest. I don't feel like a man, so. Okay. It's kind of triggering. I'm sorry, but the whole man thing just like. Arms by your side. This is the starting position for no, the test. That's what I'm doing. She's not drunk. She's just triggered. You have zero questions? No, but I just want to tell you that I suffer from really bad anxiety, especially uh, with generational trauma and PTSD around white people and cops. Like you didn't listen to what I said, man. I know. I said when I instruct. Moving you. Well, I said when I instruct you. I to know, start. and right now I just feel harassed. So okay. I said when I instruct you okay. to start. Can you just count now? You're gonna continue to I count. I am being harassed. And Big surprise, she failed the test. And playing the indigenous non-binary card didn't work. Put your hands behind your back. Don't, dude. Don't. Don't make don't, it hard. Please. Don't make it hard. No, don't. you're... You're going to get a resistance. Dude, I... You're going to get a resistance. I don't. Don't resist. Don't. Listen to me. Don't resist. Don't. You're being Come a here. white man and... Come don't. Here. I followed all of your Like... Don't resist. I'm an indigenous person like... You guys, you guys are just scaring me. Lift your tongue. Lift your tongue for me. You guys are scaring me. There's nothing to be afraid of. Yes, there is. It's called generational trauma. Okay, walk on my my vehicle. Kylene Perry was charged with a DWI. Breathalyzer can't tell what race and gender you are. But because this was her first charge, she cut a deal. If she takes a few classes, they'll go easy on her. But Kylene ditched the classes. She never showed up. She's too non-binary to stop drinking and driving. The state even gave Kylene an extension. You know, like, if you have anxiety, you get unlimited time to take the SATs, that kind of thing. What's going on here is that Kylene can't be held accountable for driving drunk. It's the white cop's fault for harassing her. Kylene's above the law because the law is racist and doesn't take into consideration her generational trauma and social anxiety. Now, the cop, on the other hand, total pro. Police used to have to deal with thugs, drunks. Now, they have to deal with professional victims, politely calling them miss and asking them to step out of the car. That's police brutality. America now has a class system. Certain victim classes deserve special treatment. In fact, better treatment. They want the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause in the Constitution, turned into kind of how we board airplanes. Instead of veterans and families with infants and sky priority boarding first, we'd like to ask the non-binary anxious indigenous to please have their boarding passes ready. You may have heard the phrase, God's hand of protection. It seems that it is something God would do. Keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand. But what happens to a nation when it decides to disobey God's laws. In America's case, it's not that God has lifted his hand of protection. It's that America has left God's hand of protection. When God led the Israelites out of bondage, he commanded them to teach their children all he had done for them, as we read in Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. God desired that the generations to come would continue to uphold all his commands. When one generation fails to instill God's laws in the next, a society quickly declines. Parents have not only a responsibility to their children, but an assignment from God to impart his values and truth into their lives. Proverbs 15.32 says, He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The Lord brought judgment upon Eli the priest because he allowed his sons to dishonor the Lord and failed to restrain them, as we read in 1 Samuel 3.13. For I have told him that I would judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. God tells us what happens if we forget his law in Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. 
because America has rejected God's knowledge and forgotten his law. It seems as though God has forgotten our children, since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments, and give him the glory that only he deserves. He has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evildoers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 1.15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end-time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Dozens of leaders from Arab and Muslim countries gathered in Riyadh on Saturday for a joint Islamic Arab summit to discuss the Israel-Gaza war. They called for an immediate end to military operations in Gaza and declared that Israel bears responsibility for crimes against Palestinians. The Middle East has been put on edge since Hamas fighters rampaged into Israel on October 7th, killing 1,200 people. Israel has escalated its assault on Gaza, where over 11,000 people had been killed as of Friday, 40% of them children, according to Palestinian officials. <laughs> Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia's de facto ruler, hosted the summit as the kingdom has sought to exert its influence to press the United States and Israel for an end to hostilities in Gaza. In an address to the summit, Prince Mohammed said the kingdom affirms its condemnation and categorical rejection of its barbaric war against our brothers in Palestine. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said Palestinians are facing a genocidal war and called on the United States to end Israeli aggression. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi hailed the Palestinian group Hamas for its war against Israel and urged Islamic countries to impose oil and goods sanctions on Israel. Raisi's trip to Saudi Arabia is the first by an Iranian head of state in more than a decade. Tehran and Riyadh ended years of hostility under a Chinese-brokered deal in March. The war has upended traditional Middle East alliances as Riyadh has engaged more closely with Iran. 
It has pushed back against U.S. pressure to condemn Hamas and put on hold its plans to normalize ties with Israel. Hamas had called on the summit to take a historic and decisive decision and move to stop the Zionist aggression immediately. Genesis 16, 1-12 Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Genesis chapter 16 began a prophecy about the baby Hagar is carrying. It is a boy, and she is to call him Ishmael. The rest of the prophecy is less favorable. Even though Ishmael will be the first son born to Abram through the Gentile maidservant Hagar, God's promises went to Isaac, Abram's second born, with his true wife Sarai. Though Ishmael will become a great nation, his people will live in conflict with everyone just as we are witnessing today. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone will be against him. He will live in hostility to his kinsmen. We learn that Ishmael's descendants become the Arabic people. These cultures have been at odds with the Jewish people for millennia. Fox News alert. Tonight, another night of mayhem here in New York City as Palestinian mobs swarm the streets and shout Hamas propaganda. Well, last night, the primetime team could hear the chaos from our offices. But police cars were vandalized, free Gaza slogans all over it. Buildings were stormed into. The New York Times lobby was piled into by a loud crew of Palestinian agitators. You'd think they'd leave the Times alone after they reported Israel bombed their hospital. They're storming into the Capitol, too. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's office was infiltrated just last night. Rise up, rise up, rise up for Palestine. 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 Genocide Gillibrand got to go over the Oh, ho. Genocide Gillibrand got to go over the Oh, ho. Why do millions of radicals get to turn the country into an ugly mosh pit? But if one mom raises her voice at a school board meeting, the FBI puts her on a terror watch list. So we've already had one death in California, an attempted murder in Indiana, our White House and our monuments are under siege, and violent assaults are happening day after day. This mostly peaceful protest movement is growing and no one's stopping it.
Montana Tucker is a model and an activist who joins us now. Where do you think this is going towards? I think, unfortunately, this is exactly how the Holocaust started. I think it's a very crazy comparison, but I grew up with two Holocaust survivor grandparents, and I heard their stories my entire life of how the Holocaust began. And what is happening now is exactly how the Holocaust began, and everyone needs to take this extremely seriously. When you say this is exactly how the Holocaust began, what do you mean by that specifically? It started off with people hating the Jews, making up stories about the Jews, propaganda about the Jews, denying certain things that are happening right in front of you. We have all the video footage of everything. We have footage of people getting beaten, killed, and people are still denying it. And that's exactly what happened back then. My grandparents would tell me they were, had friends that they were friends with their entire lives. And the second that everything came out in the news about how terrible the Jews were, and the Jews were the reason for all the problems in the world, everyone just turned on them. And that's what we're seeing right now. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.